Yes, here I am. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It is a good day to be in God's house. It is good to be praising the name above all names with you. We're His people. It's His day. We're going to worship and we're going to begin with prayer. So church, I invite you to join me in an attitude of prayer. Oh God, all that we have is a gift from you. Every hour, every moment is the result of your abundant mercy and grace. Oh God, we have responded to the call your grace puts on our lives by gathering in this space, in this sacred hour. Oh God, as we do so, we seek to proclaim your name, to sing your hymns of praise, to go to your word, and for it to guide us in our lives. We pray, O oh Lord, in that endeavor, you would grant us success through the working of your Spirit, which we ask for you to pour out upon us now, that it would open our eyes, that it would attune our ears, that it would mold our hearts and make our lives more like that of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Please stand and join us in song.
please be seated. Good morning, church. Our scripture comes from Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. Then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the way. The reading of the word. Good morning. How's your arm? Is that better? Yes. Okay. What happened to your arm? A go kart. Oh, memories. Okay. So I want y'all to really pay close attention to what I want to tell you today. It's really important that you go away from what I'm going to tell you learning something. The scripture that Miss Catherine just read was all about faith. And faith is believing and having the confidence in someone that you know you can count on when you need them. Faith is something we do blindly. We don't have to see an object and say, oh, that gives me faith. Faith is in our heart. And we have faith in Jesus Christ. Have you ever been hurt and (laughs) had to call out to somebody for help? Like your mom or dad? And you knew when you called out to them, you knew that they were going to be there. It never even crossed your mind that they wouldn't help you, right? That's faith. Jesus is always there for us. When you've got things going on in your life, you've got a bully at school, your homework's due, you don't know what to do, and life just gets big and you've got problems, call on Jesus' name and know in your heart that he is absolutely 100% going to be there for you. Does that sound pretty awesome? Yeah, it does. Okay, let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you for these children, and we pray that if they don't walk away with anything but knowing that you are always there for them and they have faith in their heart in you, that nothing can stand against them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're so happy to have Ashley with us today, and we're just so blessed to have her here.
We gather this morning coming just as we are with all the stuff of our lives, the rejoicing, the worry, and the hurt, and we gather with God's people in God's house knowing that indeed God meets us here. The same God who heard the blind man crying out, have mercy on me, hears our cries here and now. Sisters and brothers, that is good news. Friends, we're going to go to God in prayer. You will have a chance to pray quietly, and then I will lift up a prayer on our behalf as best I can. Friends, support one another in prayer as we go to God in prayer. O God, our Heavenly Father, through the grand creativity of your omnipotent power, you created all that was or is and ever will be. Through the incarnation and sacrifice of your Son, our Lord, you saved all that was and is and will be saved. O God, through the indwelling of your Spirit, You sustain life in all that was or is or ever will be. You are what gives our life meaning and purpose now and forevermore, O God. We come before you joining with the angels and proclaiming indeed you are holy, holy, holy. O God, we in your word encounter a blind man crying out for mercy and we certainly can identify with him. For we too, O God, have been waiting to encounter you, waiting for you to see and hear the cries of our hearts. And we call out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. O God, so often we think we have more to bring than the cries of our hearts, more to bring to you than our need and our brokenness. O God, for the ways in which we act like We set the itinerary of life for the way in which we think our agenda directs your kingdom, for the ways in which we seek to impose our will on your way. Forgive us, O God. Remove from us all notions of self-sufficiency so that we might cast off the cloaks of what weighs us down and come running to you in hopes of being made new and made healed. Oh God, we lift up to you the many we know who are crying out for healing. God, every time we gather, we have in our minds and on our hearts so many names. Those whom we love in hospitals and in rehabs, those recovering from surgery. Oh God, we come rejoicing for friends who have been back after an absence. God, we come before you lifting up those with aches who enter our space stiffly. Oh God, there are a variety of needs, all of whom need your healing touch in their bodies. And God, we ask for you to mercifully hear our and their cries. And God, we pray that you would open our often clouded eyes to see you near, to encounter your presence as we walk through the hard trials of life, knowing that above all else we are not forsaken, we are not alone. Oh God, we come before you today representatives of a great many families, members of this one community in this small corner of your creation, and even nearest to us, we see hurt. We see strife and struggle. We experience brokenness and loss. And God, we lift all of that up to you. Oh God, have mercy on our families, on our church, on our community. For God, we confess in every way in striving to follow you, we do so imperfectly and are in need time and time again of your peace, your reconciliation, your healing, and your guidance. 
Oh God, we come before You as people of this nation, this corner of Your creation, where we see a nation heaving. With hundreds of thousands seeking to rebuild their lives and livelihoods after natural disaster, in a nation that heaves with anticipation for what the coming weeks will bring, oh God, we lift those big, mighty needs up to You. And while, God, those, me, those needs have many names, and though we lift them up knowing that we do not have a common need, still, Lord, no need within our mouths or within our hearts is more pressing than this that I lift. Father, let Your kingdom come. Let Your will be done in our lives and our families and our church and our community, our nation and our world. O oh God, You have heard the cries of our hearts. God, who opened the eyes of the blind, open our eyes to need of neighbor. O oh God, cure the blindness within our very hearts. God, forgive us of our sins, the ways in which we fall short, the ways in which we follow Christ half-heartedly, rather than making His way our way. And, O oh God, help us to go forth bearing fruit in keeping with repentance, living joyfully as those forgiven, loved, and made whole. That we might go forth pointing the way where lost and hurting sinners like us can come to encounter the grace which we know, the grace by which we are saved. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So that passage Catherine read was a little bit different from all of the hard teachings of Jesus we have been going over for a few weeks. It is a big departure from turn the other cheek and give away everything to the wonderful story of the healing of Bartimaeus. Yes, we are done with the hard teachings of Jesus sermon series, and for a few weeks we will be looking at the lectionary readings for the week, because it's high time I let someone smarter than me pick the scripture we're looking at. Yes, friends, we are looking at the healing of blind Bartimaeus, and it is a beloved story, and it's a simple one, right? Jesus is on the way from Jerusalem to Jericho. Ahead of him is the cross. Ahead of him, the Last Supper. Ahead of him, the triumphal entry, and the very last stop, the very last thing Mark's gospel tells us that he does is heal a blind beggar on the road. What a wonderful story of a Jesus on his way to redeem the 99, and the good shepherd sees and hears and responds to the one. Bartimaeus has his own wonderful confession of faith. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. A powerful reminder that all of us have nothing with which to greet Jesus other than have mercy on me. All of us, in a way, have nothing to offer but our brokenness in the way Bartimaeus does when asked, what do you want me to do for you? And he just says, Jesus, restore my sight. We have in this story a crowd who thinks they know better because people who follow Jesus aren't immune from thinking they know best. They tell Bartimaeus, be quiet. They tell him to shut up. They tell Jesus, come over here. You can see them trying to usher him around Bartimaeus. But Bartimaeus must have taken a playbook from, or a play from my son's playbook because the more they try to get him to be quiet, the louder Bartimaeus gets. And we love it, right? This idea that he will not be deterred from his Savior or deterred from the healing which he seeks. Jesus then turns on the crowd, and the very ones who were telling Bartimaeus to shut up, he says, no, you're going to be the one to invite him in. All of us in the church should probably feel the heat on that one a little bit. 
They say, take heart, He is calling to you. And Bartimaeus does this beautiful thing where he throws off his coat and runs to Jesus, thereby casting off any semblance of decorum, any idea that there's a proper way to do this, any notion of self-sufficiency. And we like to think it's this joyful running home. But if Jesus is surrounded by a great multitudinous crowd who didn't want this guy around, and this guy is a blind man running full tilt at a voice, it probably wasn't pretty. He was probably pinballing and ricocheting off everything far and near. Jesus meets him on his level and says, What is it that you need? A beautiful reminder that Jesus engages with this man as an equal. When he tells him, I want my sight restored, Jesus says, Go, your faith has made you well, and sends him on his way. And Bartimaeus does the most faithful thing you can do when Jesus works on your life in a big way. What does he do? He gets behind and follows Jesus. Drawing nearer to Jerusalem, drawing nearer to the cross. It is a neat story, one that would be easy to put a bow on. And there really is a lot to the message of be like Bartimaeus. He's a winning example of what a disciple ought to be. But friends, this passage is part of a much larger story. This passage is part of a larger block of passages within kind of the literary setup of the Gospel of Mark. It forms a crucial crux in Mark's narrative. And friends, if we were to take our interpretive lens, that way in which we view Scripture, we're kind of called by this passage to do the opposite of what we usually do. So often when we examine a passage of Scripture, we want to zoom in, pick apart the minutia, and this one reminds us sometimes it is better off to zoom out. To reduce our interpretive optics to a little bit lower power and pick up a greater field of view. And friends, that's what we're going to do today for just a minute, because doing things like this, zooming out and seeing how Scripture fits with Scripture, seeing the narrative that the Gospel writer was going towards is what caused me to fall in love with what I do. It's the reason why I've been able to study one book for decades and not just because I'm a slow reader. Friends, I hope in looking at the Gospels in how they go together, you will fall in love with them just a little bit more as I have. So first of all, when we start describing Gospels in narrative or literary terms, some of us by nature rankle a little bit. We see the Gospel as something God wrote because it is God's Word for us. And in some ways we act like in describing it in these terms we are decreasing its spirit-filled, God-given value. But friends, that is simply not the case. As a matter of fact, when we look at the way the narrative aspect, the story the Gospel writer is trying to tell, when we look at the way it goes together and speaks to us 2,000 years plus down the line, it should inspire a great and mighty and vibrant depth of faith. Because there is no way it gets to us without the Holy Spirit's fingerprints at every single turn. It was and is and always will be God's holy word. So this scripture sets in a passage in the middle of a gospel, and the gospel writers are all seeking to do the same thing. The best and shortest and still very insufficient way that I can describe the gospels is to say, these are guys who know the answer, and now they're going back and showing their work to the problem. These are eyewitnesses and people who have interviewed eyewitnesses. They know that Jesus is the Christ, God incarnate, dead, risen, and saving. And they are all at a time when the first generation of believers who saw this stuff are dying off. They are all men who are trying to preserve and teach that message to the first community of faith in the second generation. And so they are faced with the question that we still ask today, will the next generation have faith? And so the gospel writers conduct interviews. The gospel writers speak to the eyewitnesses. The gospel writers remember what they can remember and they come up with four ways of seeing the same three-year ministry. And John, I think, says it best in the very last last verse of his gospel, chapter 21, verse 25, where he says, Not everything Jesus did I wrote down. 
As a matter of fact, if everything Jesus ever did were written, I suppose the world would not have enough room for all the books it would contain. Because each gospel writer has a specific audience. Each gospel writer has his own set of sources and seeks to highlight for a real reason what he draws our attention to. And this beautiful story of the healing of blind Bartimaeus fits within a narrative structure in Mark, fits within kind of a four-chapter block of Scripture that encompasses 8, 9, 10, and part of 11. Now, don't get me wrong. I thought about just reading that entire thing and going, well, you're getting the whole shebang today, but I wouldn't do that to Catherine. I like Catherine. Two, it wouldn't be befitting to do a Mr. Smith goes to Washington Scripture-themed filibuster up here. But that passage starts off in chapter 8 with the healing of another blind man. In 9 and 10, we see how the disciples that Jesus has are like that blind guy, and then how Bartimaeus is very much the type of blind man, the type of disciple Jesus wants. And then I think Mark lets the readers find themselves within that structure. So in Mark chapter 8, Jesus is at Bethsaida and People bring a blind man to him, and it is the oddest healing in the Gospels. It is one the man is totally silent. People bring the blind man to him and beg Jesus to touch him and heal him. Jesus is encountering this man because of the faith of others. Jesus does what he always does in the Gospel of Mark. He pulls the man aside because there has to be an exchange between them. Also, there has to be an obstacle, and this one is weird. In chapter 8, Jesus spits on the man's eyes. He doesn't get a nice little go, your faith has made you well. He gets, let's see what I can do. And as Jesus presses the spit into the man's eyes, Jesus does the weirdest thing I think he ever does. He goes, is it working? Jesus is not usually a healer who needs a mulligan or a follow-up, okay? He's... One and done. And the man goes, I see something. I think I see people, but they're walking around like trees. And so Jesus spits in his eye again, rubs it, and then the man can see clearly. It's wild. But then in the next two chapters, we are reminded how the disciples are like that man. Because that man did not seek Jesus out on his own. That man did not have a supernatural depth of faith. That man doesn't make any grand confession of faith. In that man's life, Jesus works to bring about healing, and then Jesus has to go back and keep working to bring about healing. The man's eyes are opened, but Jesus and him have more work to do. Then in the next chapter, we see that Peter is like that first blind guy. Because Jesus asked them, who do you think I am? And the disciples are going, maybe a prophet, maybe this, maybe that. And Peter gives the good confession. You are the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus says, you've got it, now don't tell anybody. We see in the scripture, Peter has had his eyes opened. But then right after that, we realize he still has to have Jesus working on him. Jesus is going to have to spit in Peter's eyes all over again. In the next chapter, Jesus tells him, I will be killed. I will be lifted up on the cross. We've talked about this passage a great deal. And what does Peter do? He rebukes Jesus, and Jesus spits in his eye with one of my favorite comebacks in all of Scripture. Get thee behind me, Satan. Peter had his eyes open to the fact that Jesus was the Christ, but his eyes are far from fully open. Then James and John, a chapter later, come to Jesus making a request, a far cry from Bartimaeus. They come to Jesus not crying out, have mercy on us. They go to Jesus saying, we want you to do us a favor. And before we tell you what it is, will you promise us you'll do it? Jesus doesn't play their game, but he asked them the same question he asked Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? They say, Jesus, in your kingdom to come, can we have the good seats? 
You know, the ones of power, the ones of prestige, the ones of privilege, can we sit on your right and on your left and Jesus acknowledges their eyes are not fully open. He says, you do not know what you are asking. Can you be baptized with the baptism I will be baptized with? Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? And then they answer probably the most foolish thing in all of Scripture. When Jesus pushes back against them, they say, no, you're wrong, we're good for it. Yes, we can. And Jesus says, no, you can't. You don't know what you're asking, but you will. Once again, they're tied in with that man in chapter 8. Jesus has sought them out. They do not stand on their own faith. Jesus has worked in their lives. Jesus has opened their eyes. They confess, your kingdom is coming and there is no stopping it. But in what they want, they tip their hand that their eyes need to be opened. They need a little spit and a little pressure. Then we get Bartimaeus. And Bartimaeus is essentially the type of blind man, the type of disciple Jesus wants to deal with. Bartimaeus is the example in Mark's Gospel. There is not a better thing you can be. But it all is within the context of Bartimaeus is the disciple Jesus wants. Peter, James, and John are the disciples he gets. And it speaks to us because Bartimaeus still today may be the type of disciple Jesus wants. But heaven help him, we're the kinds of disciples he got. So when we look at this, Jesus is going from Jerusalem to Jericho. We know what is ahead. This is his last stop before the triumphal entry, and this blind beggar is calling out. He cries, Jesus, Son of David. Meaning he is acknowledging Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Jesus is the one who will sit on the throne of King David. He is the first person in Mark's Gospel to fully get who Jesus is within their history and context. A blind man. It's as though Mark is saying to the reader down through the centuries, in this moment, the disciples and the crowd following him are foolish enough that a blind man saw Jesus more clearly than they. It's these little hidden notes that have kept me in love with Scripture over the years. And the crowd, of course, they go, no, no. It says they rebuke him, which is Mark kind of tipping his hand to us that look back at the previous chapters. Because rebuke is kind of an odd word, but it's the word used when Jesus rebukes Peter and Peter rebukes Jesus. It's a reminder that in this case, they are rebuking the man coming in righteousness, and Jesus has to spit in their eyes, so to speak. Rebuke ties it with what comes before. And Jesus makes the very crowd that have been telling this guy, shut up, he's not here for you, call him over to them. Jesus says, call him to me. And they finally do, they turn around and they say, take heart, he is calling to you. And the man runs to him and Jesus says, what can I do for you? What is it you want me to do? It's also worthy of note that when the man is crying out, have mercy on me, he doesn't immediately start crying out, heal me. It is as though Mark is pointing to the fact that no matter your brokenness, no matter your situation, when we approach Jesus, we have no greater need than the need for forgiveness. We have no greater need than the need for mercy. And in the way he approached stands in stark contrast to disciples who said, hey Jesus, do me a favor and promise me you'll do it. The response Jesus is looking for is a realization that all we can hope for is mercy. All we can appeal to is grace. And when Jesus gets him over through the crowd to himself, and he asks him, what is it you want me to do for you? Yes, one, it is a beautiful reminder that when we meet with those in need, sometimes the greatest thing we can do is not assume we know what they need. Not assume that we have their need figured out, but to meet them where they are, hear their story, treat them as a real whole person, and say, what really is it that you need? 
And the man says, good teacher, rabbi, restore my sight. It's also worthy of note that Mark is once again drawing on the previous chapters because that, what do you want me to do for you, is the exact same question he asked James and John. When they came to him cocky, wanting power, this man comes begging for mercy and wanting healing. Jesus asks the same question of longtime disciples and the brand new blind beggar and gets a very different result. Then when this man is healed, Jesus says, go, Your faith has made you well. Go on your way. And Mark ends the passage with, and so he followed them on the way. It's a beautiful reminder that when Jesus works in our lives, when we really experience grace, mercy, redemption, healing, the only appropriate response is to realize my way is no longer my way. His way is the way. Where he is going is where I am going. And it's a beautiful, stunning lesson in discipleship because can you imagine being blind and receiving your sight. Now, every sunrise is a gift. Every sunset is a gift. What would this man have missed out on seeing? Did he have an adorable child at home like mine, but I'm biased, that he wanted to go see? Did he have relatives whose face he has not seen that he wants to go see? Is there a mountain? Is there an overlook? Now that he can see, does he finally want to go fishing or golfing or anything else he couldn't do before? Let's face it, he's a guy and he hasn't been able to see for a while. He'd probably like to look at a woman. But instead, with his newfound sight, he looks only at Jesus and where he is going. And that story all fits together in the healing of the man at the pool, the request of James and John, Peter having his eyes open but not all the way and having to be rebuked, and Bartimaeus, this little-known blind beggar who sees Jesus for who he really is, knows that all he can ask for is mercy and healing, and then gives his life to Jesus all in on the march towards the cross. So friends, where do, where do we find ourselves in the story this morning? I think a lot of us would be the blind man at the pool of Bethsaida right in between two spits, as it were. We have encountered Christ through the faith of the faithful. I say this a lot. We stand on the shoulders of giants. All of us are in this room with a faith to practice because mom and dad and me, mom and papa prayed. We are all here because a generation preserved the faith and passed it on in the same way that blind man got to Jesus because his friends knew Jesus could do something. And they took him whether he wanted to be there or not. And then Jesus pulled him aside. Jesus spit in his eyes, which is an amazing kind of reminder that sometimes when Jesus moves in our lives, it's uncomfortable. Sometimes when Jesus confronts our blindness, the ways our eyes need to be open, it feels like getting spit in the eye. And then the man goes, Jesus, you've, you've done something. Jesus, you've made it better. Jesus, I'm, I'm on the way but I still have a long way to go. I still can't see you clearly. I still have more healing I am in need of. Jesus, you're going to have to do that uncomfortable thing that only you can do again. I think a lot of us are between two spits. Good news, Jesus didn't run out. Good news, Jesus didn't give up on the man. Good news, J Jesus didn't say, this is going to ruin my batting average for miracles. Jesus did what was necessary to finish drawing that man to himself. Maybe some of us here this morning are like Bartimaeus. Maybe you've come here today crying out with the only plea of your heart being, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Maybe all you have to offer Him is your hopes for healing and the brokenness of your life and heart. If that is the case, then hear the words to Bartimaeus. Take heart. He's calling 
you. And for many of us in the church, I think we see ourselves in the crowd. I think we see ourselves as those who believe in Jesus, who want to know where He is going, who seek to follow Him, but maybe every now and then at our own peril, we think we know best the course the mission should take. We know who He's here to see and who He's not. Maybe we at times run the risk of telling the one who is lost and broken and crying out and hurting, quiet down. I pray to God Almighty, it is not so. The friends, within this passage, Jesus turns to the crowd and says, tell him to come here. And they say, take heart He is calling you. Friends, in all of the Gospel of Mark, I think if you were to sum up the purpose for the church, it would be to go forth into the world proclaiming the message to the lost, the hurting, and the crying out. Take heart. He is calling you. May we be disciples and may we be a church that does just that. This Gospel stuff is good stuff. Amen. We'll sing together. In some ways, what happens at this table is indeed a mystery to us. How bread and cup become flesh and blood and the means of salvation is always wrapped in mystery. Yet every time we gather at this table, our eyes are opened by the Jesus who meets us here. Let us now remember our Lord the way He commanded His first disciples to do so. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, He took bread and He broke it and said, This is My body broken for you. Take, eat in remembrance of Me. In the same way, He also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Poured out for the forgiveness of your sins. Take, drink in remembrance of Me. Sisters and brothers, every time we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim His life, death, and resurrection until He comes again. Let's pray together. Praise your holy name, Father. Praise your holy name, Jesus. Righteous, holy, merciful. Praise your holy name, Holy Spirit. Father God, please send your spirit afresh into our hearts in this moment of community so that we might know that we are never alone. He is here at this table, revealing God, that we see Him face to face. It is here that we touch and handle things unseen. Through the breaking of the bread, through the cup, we have blessed at your table. We are sharing the body and the blood of Christ that gives us eternal life. We pray this foretaste of the kingdom we receive at this table will fire our imaginations and fuel our passions to begin to embody your future here and now. Cause us to tremble, Lord, and we deep in that trembling into thanksgiving and distill that thanksgiving into transformation. We pray as our King and Savior taught us, our Father, Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This table is not a Disciples of Christ table. It is not First Christian Church's table. It is the Lord's table. All who seek Christ are welcome to partake. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. After freely receiving and now freely giving, we cry out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on us. Love, help us to be loving. Forgiven, help us to be forgiven. God of peace, God of grace, make us, make us people of gratitude. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Your best gift of all. Amen.
O oh God, may You bless these offerings. May they be used to do Your will. O oh God, may this Your church be good stewards of every good and perfect gift which comes from You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, all that we do in our lives of faith is but a response to the grace of Christ that moved first. When we confess that He is the Christ for the very first time, we respond to His grace. When we enter the waters of baptism, it is a response to His grace. And when, through the good confession, we join with the church body, we respond to His grace. If you have been moved to make such a confession of faith, the table is open during the hymn of invitation. Children who will be taking part in the Christmas kind of recital. There's a pageant. That's the word I'm looking for. Words are hard for me sometimes. Meet with my wife Elizabeth directly after this service. Two meetings, same time. All right, that's all the housekeeping. Go in peace with this benediction. As you go, may God direct your steps. May the Spirit open your eyes as you go forward on Christ's way. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.